Now we are on, we're back on the Galatians series. We kind of took a break last week as we celebrated our 25th anniversary. And where we left off, if you remember, Paul was telling us and teaching us about how he feels, how he knows that we are justified by our faith, that we are made right with God by our faith and not by the words. And he talks about himself throughout the whole time. He talks about Peter and the conversation he had with Peter, but then he brings it on all to his own story. Today, the lenses are gonna shift a little bit. He's gonna move the spotlight from himself and shine it now on the Galatians, the church in Galatia itself. So today, it is my privilege to bring you Galatians chapter three, verse one to 22. It's gonna be a fairly long passage. So what I would love for you to do is if you have your physical Bible, turn with me now to Galatians chapter three. And if you have your mobile phone apps where you can read the Bible, Open it up to Galatians chapter three and we will go through this together. Today's message, if you're taking notes, is titled, How do I know if I am saved? How do I know if I am saved? Let's bow our heads in prayer as we get into the word. Spirit of God, would you come and be with us? Would you speak exactly the words that you want us to hear? Would you say exactly what we need in our situation right now? We open our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. When I was a young man, I was leading youths. And I had a group of youths whom I loved and I cared for as I did my first stint in ministry. That was a long time ago. Clearly, a long time ago. And I was leading this particular young lady, this girl, who would come up to me every other week, if not every other month, and with fear and tears sometimes in her eyes, she would come and have a conversation with me about whether or not she's a Christian. Whether or not when she dies, is she going to make it to heaven or is she gonna find herself in hell? And there are times where she opens up the Bible to me. She actually reads the Bible and she opens it up to me and she asks me questions like, Dan, the Bible says, that narrow, wide is the gate, wide is the path that leads to destruction, and narrow is the gate that leads to life, to Jesus, to heaven. How do I know if I'm on that narrow or if I'm on the white path? And she would ask me questions like, when I die, would I see Jesus and will I hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, or will I hear the words, away from me, you evildoer, I never knew you. How do I know if I am saved? How do I know if I am gonna make it heaven if I were to die today? Maybe some of us, you come to church today and you're still wrestling with those questions. You can be a Christian who have been in church for a long time or you are fresh in church just for a few weeks and you're checking church out, you're checking Jesus out. In your heart, maybe you're asking this same question as the girl that I was leading. How do I know if I am saved? And by saved, I'm saying, how do I know if I can be, I am accepted by God and I can enter into his family? Today, what Paul does is he's going to, he's going to talk about that particular question and unpack it for the church in Galatia as he answers the question that they have. How do I know if I am saved? Let's turn to the first verse. The first thing that Peter, the first thing that Paul tells the church in Galatia is this, you foolish Galatians. The word foolish does not literally mean stupid, it's just unthinking. You know the truth, but you're not thinking about it. You heard it before, but you're not mindful of it. The first thing that he points them to is their spiritual experience. How do, how do you know if you are saved? Number one, through your spiritual experience. And Paul says this, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit? I want you to note the word Spirit coming up multiple times. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again, I ask you, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by you believing what you heard? He starts off by asking, 
who has bewitched you? For before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified. Long time ago, in the time of Paul, in the time of the early church, there was this particular belief that there is this supernatural spiritual force called the evil eye. And on the screens, I prepared a slide to show you what the evil eye looks like. This is a picture of a mosaic, uh, uh, of a mosaic, mosaic piece of art that was found through archaeology. And it dates back all the way to the first century, the second century. If you go to the museum in Turkey, you will find this piece. It is a mosaic of an evil eye. Because the people believe that there is a spiritual force called the evil eye. That if you were to look into that eye, you will believe everything that it shows you. It will lie to you. It will charm you. It will bewitch you. And everything that is real around you becomes false. And you believe everything the evil eye shows you. Now this is what Paul is referring to when he says the word bewitch. It is actually the Greek word baskaino, in which appears in the Bible only one time. It is not a Christian word. It is a worldly pagan witchcraft word, if you were to say it that way. The only time it appears is in here. Paul is saying, who has pulled the wool over your eyes? Then now you begin to look at the evil eye and forget what I have shown before your very eyes before, that Jesus Christ was crucified, the cross. And he's saying that if you were to be bewitched, if you were to be charmed with the evil eye, you will begin to believe that your salvation, that you are saved, that you are accepted by God by doing the works of the law, by flesh, by the flesh he's talking about, by your own strength. But at the same time, he's also talking about literal flesh, by literally cutting off a piece of your flesh, which is circumcision. And he said, but before your very eyes, before this, I showed you that your salvation, your standing with God is not dependent on you, but it is by believing what you heard. It is by the Spirit of God that you have received. And it is by the cross that you can be saved. You see, what happened was the church in Galatia, they forgot the good news when they focused on the bad news. What is the Judaizers' bad news? People who came along and told them this bad news, what were they saying? They were saying, you are not enough to be saved. You are not enough to be accepted. Yes, you believe, but that is not enough because you are not enough. You have to become like a Jew. You have to become like one of us. You have to start believing the law. You have to start doing it. In fact, you have to start circumcising yourself so that you can become like one of us. That's the bad news. You are not enough. But what is Paul's good news to them? He's saying the cross, the cross is enough. You don't have to become. You just need to believe. That's what Paul was saying. Before your very eyes, I've shown you the cross. It is enough. You just need to believe. And Paul says in verse 4, that if you forget all that, what I've told you, then everything that you have experienced, even if you've come to church every week, even if you've experienced God for real in your life, if you begin to believe that you have to come back to becoming someone in order to be accepted by God, then all that you've experienced is in vain. It was all for nothing. You can come to church for decades, but it was all for nothing. You can read your Bible all you want, but that was all for nothing. You can pray all you want every day, every morning at 5 a.m. in the morning, but it was all for nothing. That's the bad news. The good news is, but you can believe the cross. If a person begins to get charmed by the evil eye, and I believe this is what Paul is saying, if you look into the evil eye and you get charmed by it, how can you break out of its spell? Very simple, by looking away from it. By looking away from the evil eye. And that is what Paul is trying to say. He's saying, focus your eyes on something else. You know what he's doing here to the, to the Galatians? Where he says, you foolish Galatians. He is like a basketball coach. Anybody ever watch NBA? When you call timeout and the coach calls all the players to come. Come guys, come. We have this couple of seconds where we're going to get back into the game. 
Guys, guys, come on, focus. Focus here, look at me. I know those guys, I know those guys are telling you something else. Don't focus on them, forget about them. Now focus on me. I want you to focus on what your experience with God has been. I want you to focus on your spiritual experience. God showed up for you, man. I want you to focus on Jesus right now. I want you to focus on the cross because the cross is enough. I want you to focus back on who God is and how he has shown up in your life by the power of your spirit. Some of us this morning, you have encountered the Holy Spirit through spiritual experiences. And it can be a healing in your life, a miraculous healing. It can be a healing that you have experienced through somebody else. Somebody else got healed and you were there with them, walking in them, with them in that moment. It can be a moment in worship. Maybe this morning as you're raising your hands and singing, God's peace came over you. And you begin to cry and you begin to encounter God in that moment. You don't know why you're crying, but you are. And that's a spiritual moment. It's a spiritual experience. Some of us walk into church or somewhere sometimes and you feel a supernatural peace. You ever felt that? Somewhere in your heart, you just feel at peace even when things are going on around you. Some of us have a miraculous answered prayer in your life. You prayed for something as simple as, God, would you just help me to get through these exams? And He does. Even though you didn't study for it, He does. And that's a supernatural experience. Some of us have experienced that. And you know what? Your spiritual experience is God's way of marking your life, of showing you that I'm real, that I'm here. And don't you forget that. Don't you forget that I showed up in big and small ways in your life. Your spiritual experience. Come on, focus on that right now. I'm real. You know, a couple of months ago, I adopted a dog. His name is Max. I love Max. And one of the things that I realize Max likes to do, maybe dog owners can all uh, 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 relate. Max likes to pee. And he likes to pee everywhere. Now he has a good friend, a neighbor of ours, who, uh, and his do- uh, my, a neighbor of ours has a dog, and the dog is called Yoda. What a great name, right, Yoda. And, and Yoda is a friend of Max. Now there's one time Max went to Yoda's house for a play date. I know dogs have play dates too, so cool, right? And then Max goes into the yard and plays with Yoda, and then he goes up to Yoda's toys, and he begins to pee on it. Now, if you know anything about dogs, dogs pee on things in order to mark their territory, right? I have a picture up there. They like to pee on random stuff as if it is theirs. When they pee on it, they're saying, this is mine. So Max goes up to Yoda's toys and he begins to pee on it. This is mine, he says. And guess what Yoda does? Yoda goes over to his toy and say, no, it's not. No, it's not. And Max goes up back to the toy and says, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And Yoda and Max and Yoda, there came a point of time, in time, where Max had no more pee. But he was just doing this because he wanted to mark his territory. Today, the devil is trying to do the same in our lives. See, God has marked your life saying you belong to me by spiritual encounters, by spiritual experiences. You have, you have, you have, Encounter God for real in your life. But the devil is trying to pull the wool over your eyes and say, God is telling you that you're not enough. God has left you. God has distanced himself away from you. You are not good enough to come to God. Don't let the devil bewitch you into focusing on your insufficiency. He's telling you are not enough. You need to become better. You need to quit that habit. You need to stop doing whatever you're doing. You need to be in control of your anger. You need to stop lying. You need to be a better husband. You need to be a better mom. You need to become in order to be received by God and accepted by God. You are not enough. But Paul reminds us this morning, focus on the sufficiency of the cross. The cross is enough. You just need to believe. God has showed up in your life. The second way that Paul tells us, how do I know I can be saved? Is through scriptural evidence, through the Bible. Now what he does in the next part of the passage is very compact, concise, and sometimes even complex. So what I'm gonna do 
is I'm gonna give you a little bit of commentary verse by verse, because what he does is he refers a lot back to the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. And he doesn't have to explain what he's doing because the people that he's writing to already understands what he's saying. Is they already know the context. It's kind of like the saying, with great power comes great responsibility. Where do you get that from? Spider-Man. It was that moment where, where Uncle Ben was dying and he grabbed the hand of Spider-Man and he says, with great power comes great responsibility. And he dies. You, for those of us who know the story, you get it, you get it. I don't have to explain to you. In the same way, when he says what he says in this passage, they get it. They, he doesn't have to explain, but we need to explain it a little bit. So what we're gonna do is we go through verse six to verse 14, and I'll give you a bit of commentary. Now, everybody has a favorite Bible character, right? My, my favorite Bible character is Jesus. Paul's favorite Bible character, other than Jesus, is Abraham. He, he shows up so many times in Paul's letters. So here he, he goes back to his favorite Bible character in order to explain what, how you're being saved and how we know we're saved. In verse 6, he says this, So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So what he was saying that Abraham believed that God had given him the promises and even though he was 90 years old, God promised him, you will have a son still. Now, he didn't have a son yet at, at the age of 90. And God promised him, I will give you a son at the age of 90. He received that promise and he believed it. God says, I will give you a land. God says, I will make your children your, your, as, as countless as the stars in the sky. And then he believed it. In Genesis chapter 15, that's what it says, that he was credited, given to, to him by God, a sense of righteousness. And verse 7, he says, understand then that there that those who have faith are like children of Abraham. So those who have the same belief as Abraham, when God speaks and you believe what God says, you are like Abraham, you're like his children. In Romans chapter four, verse 23 to 24, Paul wrote this, the words it was credited to him were written not for Abraham alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in Him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So when you say, I believe in Jesus, you become like a children, a child of Abraham. In verse eight to nine, he says this, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So what he's saying is, not only will you, not only will the Jews or the Israelites, the biological children of Abraham become like his children, but even the Gentiles, the non-Jews, every nation can become a child of Abraham through their faith. By their faith, anyone can become like Abraham's children and are therefore eligible to inherit the same blessings as Abraham. You and I, when we have the same faith as Abraham, we believe in God, we believe what God says, we can receive the same blessings as Abraham. That's what it says. And Paul goes on to say this, this is the gospel. In verse nine, he says, this was the gospel that was announced in advance to Abraham. What is the gospel in here? That anyone, everyone who believes the same way that Abraham believes, becomes a child of Abraham and can inherit, in, can inherit the promise of God. And then he switches gear a little bit. Now he says, enough about Abraham. Let me move on to what those guys are telling you, that you have to believe and follow the law. He says this, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, curses everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. He's saying, whoever doesn't follow everything written in the book of the law, which is the first five books of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. If you don't do everything in it, you will not be blessed. In fact, you will get the opposite, which is to be cursed. Why? Because the moment I miss out something in the law, I have failed to do everything in the law. And if I have failed to follow the law, then I have broken the law. When I came to church this morning, I had to go past about seven roundabouts and three traffic lights. 
And on most days, I'm a very compliant driver. So I would stop at the red light, you know, I would slow down at the amber. No, 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 I don't drive past the amber. I slow down at the amber and I would stop at the red light. I would go when it's green. Now imagine this one particular morning, let's say, right? I go to the first traffic light and I follow, the, I follow what it says, red, fine, I stop. And I go at green. And I go to the second light and it says amber. Okay, I slow down, it turns red, I stop. Green, I go. Now I'm coming to the last traffic light. Amber is turning red. It turns red and I decide I'm late for church. I'm late for work. I'm just gonna beat the red light and I beat the red light. And do 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 do. I don't know what the siren sounds like, but do 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 do. And then the police comes over, pulls me over, and says, "Sir, yes, officer. You beat the red light. Driver's license, please." But officer, you don't understand. I did pretty well for the last two traffic lights. I slowed down when I was supposed to. I stopped when I was supposed to. I I I I just messed up for this one. I. Surely, that, come on, po police, that's, Mr. Officer, that must be okay. We all know that that's not going to work. Because the moment you break one law, you have broken the law. And so it is with the law here. If you fail to do something in the law, you have broken everything in the law. You have failed to follow the law. And it, it, he goes on in verse 11 to say, Clearly no one then who relies on the law can be made right with God, can be justified before God. Because the righteous will live by faith. What does he mean here? He's saying if you and I were to be real to ourselves, if we were to be authentic to ourselves, then we must admit that we are all lawbreakers at some point of time. We did something wrong at some point of time. And if the keeping of the law or the works of the law was the way to get right with God, then the reality is no one would be able to get right with God. And Paul is saying and reminding us, actually, the ones who are right with God, they don't live by the law. They live by faith and not by keeping the law. And in verse 12, he goes on to say this, the law is not based on faith, on the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. What is he saying? He's saying, essentially, the results of keeping the law and keeping the faith are completely different. If you try to keep the law, your life will, will be all about lawfulness. I must pray. I must pray, so therefore I pray. I must read the Bible, so therefore I read the Bible. I must come to church. So I will come to church. You know what? The Bible says I can't have bitterness in my heart. I can't be angry towards my, my family, my spouse, my children, my parents. It's all about lawfulness. I must, I can't. But if you try to keep the faith, your life will be all about faithfulness. It's no longer I must pray, but I actually get to pray. I actually get to come near to God and talk to Him. It's no longer, I must read the Word of God, but I actually get to hear the voice of God through His Word. It's no longer, I must come to church, but I get to come and be amongst God's people and worship Him in His presence. It's no longer, I must stop feeling unforgiveness and bitterness and anger. But you can say, I can stop feeling angry. I can have forgiveness. I can release my bitterness because God has enabled me to do so. Verse 13, he goes on to say this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hung on a pole, which is the cross. Brothers and sisters, I have news for you. Christ died on the cross so that he has taken on the curse of our failures and of the law upon himself. So that you and I no longer need to depend on the law, but we just need to depend on Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this. Paul said this. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us. He became a sin for us. So that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. That if you and I believe in Jesus right now, we can be made right before God. 
And in verse 14, this is really important. Listen to this. He redeemed us, Jesus redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. I want you to note the word Gentiles in verse 14. It is the exact same Greek word as all nations in verse 8. All nations and Gentiles. It is the same Greek word ethne, which is also found in the Great Commission. Therefore go and make disciples of ethne, of all nations, of Gentiles, of all nations, of all people groups, of all tribes. Paul is saying in here, in verse 14, Christ redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to all people, you and I, through Christ Jesus. What is the evidence of that blessing? It is the promise of the Spirit. The Spirit in you is the evidence of God's blessing. It is the evidence of God receiving you and accepting you into His family. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 39, when the people heard Peter preaching, and they were cut to the hearts, the Bible says, and they asked Peter, Peter, what must we do now that we hear the Word of God? Peter said this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he goes on to say this, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you are forgiven of your sins, when you repent, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, Jews and Israelites, for you and your children. And then he goes on to talk about the non-Jews. And for all who are far off, all across this world, all across this planet, and for all whom the Lord God will call. You and I today, we can receive the Spirit. If you are a believer, you will have received God's Spirit. And if you are not a believer, you can receive God's Spirit in you. Which brings us to the third and final point. So Paul said, number one, you know you are saved when you have encountered God through spiritual experience. Number two, you know you are saved by the Bible's promise, by what God says in His Word. Number three, you know you are saved by God's promise, by God's promise. In verse 15, he says this, brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. By a human covenant, he means will. When you write a will, when someone is about to die or when someone knows that their days are numbered, they write a will. When you write a will, no one can add to that will or minus it or add some terms and conditions or add some criteria to it. Not the lawyer, not the solicitor, not the person who's going to inherit the, the, the inheritance. No one can touch the will when it is said. In the same way he's saying, this is how God's promise works. The, when God's promise is given to someone, no one can change it. No one can add to it. No one can subtract it. This is what it means to have God's promise. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to use this very interesting technology to help us to understand a little bit more of what Paul is saying in verse 15 to 22. Would you give a big hand uh, for our media team and our technology team who put this together? <laughs> Last week, Pastor Benny reminded us that we are a forward-looking church. We are a church of the future. And friends, the future is here. The future is now. So Paul is saying in verse 16, the promise was spo promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. So it was given to Abraham. And it was given for people. And this is the promise. The promise of God. Okay? He actually says many promises. It's actually plural. There are many promises that God gave to Abraham. But he's trying to pull one out in particular. The promise. And remember what the promise is? The promise of the Spirit. 
the promise. He goes on to talk about the promise throughout this part. So it was given to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say to seeds, which is many people, but to your seed. And this seed, we now know is Jesus. Jesus. So the promise is given to Abraham, also given to the seed, which is Jesus. And he goes on in verse 17. What I mean is this, the law which was introduced 430 years later, 430 years later, this is the law, okay? He says, does not set aside the covenant. It doesn't change the covenant. Remember, the human will cannot be changed arbitrarily. In the same way, when God has made that promise, the law, whatever that came after it, cannot change God's promises. So he's saying, it does not set aside the covenant or the promise previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. In verse 18, for if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. It's not this anymore. If you can get to God from here, then you don't need this anymore. You don't need this anymore. But as it is, you can't change that. Wonderful technology. So the law doesn't change the promise. And at the end of the day, there will be people who will receive this promise. Okay? My, hand, my drawing is really ugly. It's like a two-year-old. And then it goes on to say this. But God in His grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. And then he says in verse 19, why then was the law given at all? It was given because of transgressions or sin until the seed, which is Jesus, to whom the promise referred had come. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says this, do not think that I have come to abolish or to do away with the law and the prophets, but I have come to fulfill them. So the law in Jesus was fulfilled. Jesus made it possible now to go and enter into the promises of God, not by the law, but by himself. He, he, he has fulfilled the law and brought people back to the promise. 2,000 years later, after Jesus, we're still here. And we can come to inhabit or inherit God's promises to Abraham through Jesus. And he goes on to say this, the law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. Huh, who is this guy? A mediator. He doesn't say it explicitly here, but it actually refers to Moses. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. He's basically saying this. The promise of God was given directly to Abraham and to the children of Abraham directly from God. There is no mediator. But the law was given to the people through a mediator. There was somebody in between, and this is Moses. So the promise of God is superior to the, to the law of God. Why? Because it came direct from God. Between Moses and Jesus was about 1,450 years. All this time, the promise of God had not changed. Because nothing can change it. Not even the law. That's what he's saying. And in verse 21, is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by law. Now, if we were to live without sin, then yes, we can get back to God. But because we are all lawbreakers, remember we talked about this? We are all lawbreakers. There's no way any one of us can fulfill all of the law. There is no way we can get to God through the law. So if the law had a way to get us to God, it would have. But as it is, it cannot. And in verse 22, this is the clincher. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin. So that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Quick question. After we talked about all these things, let's answer some quick questions, but really important one. What was promised? What is this promise? The promise of the Spirit. It is the promise of the Spirit that, was, that is given to the people who believe. 
when God Spirit comes upon you. You know what that means? God is in you and God is with you. It is not just, let me give you my power. Let me give you peace. Let me give you a little bit of prosperity. I will give you a little bit of security. I got your house. I get your car. I get your career. I get you your dreams. I get your ambition. I give you good health. It's not just the blessings of God itself, but it is God Himself who is going to inhabit and dwell with you. Everywhere that you walk, you're going to walk with God, in God, around God, submerged in God. This is the promise. Wow! In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14, Paul said this, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed... You were marked. Remember we talked about marked? You were marked in Him with a seal. You know what this seal is like? It's like little kids who go to school and they bring their lunch boxes. When your kid goes to school or when you go to school, chances are your lunch box, your water bottles, your jumpers and your school uniform has your name on it. So that if you were to lose it, people know who to return it to. So that if somebody wants to touch your lunch, you can legit tell them, hey, my name is on this watermelon. Don't you eat my watermelon. This is my crunch and sip. God is saying, I put my name on you. I mark you with a seal. What that means is you belong to me and no one can touch you. Somebody wants to touch you, they have to come through me. Somebody wants to own you, they're going to have and come face to face with me. God has marked you with a seal. And what is the seal? The promised Holy Spirit. When God's Spirit is in you, you belong to God. Who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. You are God's possession. To the praise of His glory. Brothers and sisters, listen to what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit in a Christian is what makes the Christian truly Christian. I say it again. The Holy Spirit in a Christian is what makes the Christian truly Christian. You become a Christian when you have the Holy Spirit in you. He is the ultimate proof of God's salvation and seal of acceptance. This is God's promise. And how do you receive God's promise? The Holy Spirit is given on account of faith. And it will be received on account of faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ, he says in verse 22. What about Jesus Christ? That he is the son of God. That he came to live a faultless life on earth. That he died on the cross, a death he did not deserve for our sins, that He was raised again on the third day. He came back to life by the power of the same Spirit now in us. And that He ascended to heaven and is now seated on the right hand of God. And not just that, but sometime, someday, He will come back to earth for us to bring us back into the presence of God so that all the tears and all the pain and all the suffering of this world will be history and we can be with God forever through Jesus Christ, our Son. This is what it means to have faith. You know, in verse 22, when he says, given to those who believe, the Greek grammar for the word belief is actually continuous. So what this means is you should actually read it this way. So that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe and continue to believe. Many of us have now believed in Jesus. We've come to know Jesus. The big question is, do you continue to believe what you've heard about Jesus? So brothers and sisters, in conclusion, how do we know we are saved? Paul is saying three things. By your spiritual experience, by, spiritual, by scriptural evidence, and number three, by God's promises, the, God, the Holy Spirit in us who believe in Jesus. So don't miss this. Here is the key. We receive God's promise by believing right, not behaving right. 
We receive God's promise by believing right, not behaving right. And here is the only application from today's message. Belief right. And maybe at this point of time, some of us are wondering, maybe you're thinking to yourself, but Pastor Dan, I already believe. I already believe in Jesus. I do. I believe in Jesus. But that's not what Paul is saying here. You know why? Because the Judaizers who are pulling the wool over the Galatians' eyes, they too believe in Jesus. The point is not believing in Jesus. But the point is to believe what you have heard. The gospel. The good news. That the cross of Jesus Christ is enough for you. Not just to believe in Jesus, but to believe that your belief, your faith in Jesus is all you need today to receive the Holy Spirit, to be saved, and to be accepted by God. Some of us this morning, you might feel distanced from God. You might feel that you're disqualified because of things that you've done. Maybe because of who you are this morning. Maybe you messed up. You got angry with your spouse even before you came to church. Maybe you have had a deep sense of resentment for something that has happened to you. And you feel like you're not measuring up in order to get into God's good books. Maybe you don't feel good enough. And you believe in Jesus. Yes, you do. But you struggle with coming close to God and being in His presence because you feel disqualified. Today, God is reminding us, what does it take to be accepted by God? All it takes is that you believe what you have heard, the gospel, the good news. Church, would you just stand where you are right now? We're gonna get into a time of prayer. We're gonna get into a time of worship. City campus, you can take over at this point of time. I believe God is tugging at some of our hearts this morning. For some of us, maybe you've never prayed that prayer to receive Jesus into your life and you want to become a Christian. I want to invite you to make this decision to say yes to Jesus, to believe the good news. And it is good news. And then there might be some of us also who you are a Christian already. You've been coming to Christ. You've been coming to church for a long time already. But you want to make that commitment to say, God, I believe in you. No longer to count on myself. No longer to count on my works. No longer to feel that I'm not good enough. But to believe that you are good enough. That your cross is sufficient for me. That you have what it takes to bring me into your presence, Jesus. Because of what you have done, but not because of what I am doing right now. And if that's you, we're going to go into a time of worship. If you want to receive Jesus for the first time, give a nudge to the person next to you and say, I want to receive Jesus. And I want to invite you to come to the front as we worship. And if you are a Christian and you're making that commitment to say, I want to believe. I want to believe. And I want to come close to God again. And you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. I invite you to come to the front again. Let's get into a time of praise and worship as we talk about the cross, sing about the cross. The mighty work of the cross of Jesus is more than enough for us this day. The work of God is complete.